Good morning, good day, good evening, wherever you may be. I've already talked to a lot of you. Good to see you all around. We may be a few seconds early, but that's fine. So, welcome to episode 9. It's all about galaxy clusters today. Do let me know, I've got several windows open. Sometimes there are some technical glitches and I'm doing my best to see everything. Sometimes it's not possible. This type of live streaming is still very new and um, the software is being updated all the time. So sometimes there are glitches that I'm not even aware of. Like we had frozen screens in the last, uh, um, in the last session. I apologize for that. Uh, that's why I have another computer and I can actually separately see your comments now, which is really helpful. So if something crashes, I can still communicate. Okay. Well, anyway, thank you for your patience and your endurance. That is great. So what you do see today is the roofs. Well, you don't see this, but the roofs are closed at the moment. That is not an issue. I did, however, put a beautiful, what do you say? We have liftoff. Yes, we do. <laughs> That's good. Yes, we do. There is always a, by the way, there's always a delay. Um, it's about 30 seconds to one minute, which is a bit irritating. I don't know why YouTube works that way. So it takes uh, takes uh, some time until I will know that you, you have a, an issue or so on. But the um, uh, I think the live comments that come through, I can see instantaneously. So sometimes there's a little bit of mismatch here, but it's okay. So what you see there is a, um, a beautiful animation. It's a, um, it's a time lapse from our all sky camera in um, Siding Spring. And you can see the beautiful Milky Way rising from the east. And then really, it, it virtually flips around during the year. It's really fascinating to see because I was there in, in August and I could see how the, how the uh, Milky Way really rolls vertically up. It's incredible. Uh, if you ever have the opportunity to go to the Southern Hemisphere and see the Milky Way, it is absolutely, it is really three-dimensional for the sky. And um, that is going to be a lot of the topic today, but we're going to travel much, much further just wanted to make you aware of um yeah you can see the roofs are closed at the moment but that is nothing to worry about uh we at i telescope are well prepared and have prepared everything just wanted to show you from last week's episode do um take a look uh we always upload all the images for you to see okay great fo photo quality yes well that's good that's good Oh, and there's Peter coming in from Essex. Hi, Peter. Good to have you. Good to have you all around. So do remember, go to the recent episode. We have put all the links there for you. You can download all the images in color. If you do have the courage, you can even try and make color images yourself from this. So that's why we put it there for you to experiment. 1 a.m. in Melbourne, Australia. And that is exactly right, Sean. We have just... Um, uh, we're going through these incredible time changes because in Europe uh, and in um, actually in North America, we've just changed to summertime. And since the 1st of April last week, um, Melbourne and uh, Sydney and so on have changed their time zone. So this is sometimes really confusing and not easy to plan, especially for us because I have to take the North American time into consideration and so on because we're trying to keep things constant and consistent in some way. And um, anyway, we'll talk, we'll talk about that. From South Africa, my goodness, you know, South Africa has the most beautiful, hey, South Africa has the most beautiful skies. I mean, I grew up in South Africa. It was incredible. And um, I love to go the, to the Karoo, <laughs> the wonderful Karoo. It's, it's very open, very similar to the beautiful skies we have in Australia too. And of course, you have, this, you have the access to the Southern Hemisphere, which I am... Uh, very biased uh, for I mean north uh, the, our, you know they always have this joke the astronomers were born in the no the northern hemisphere but the really God made the beautiful skies in the, in the southern hemisphere it's always a joke uh, maybe not all people agree with me but I certainly see it that way <laughs> okay so let's get going let me just switch back to our uh, picture here so what you see here is Hi from Washington DC. Yeah, well, I hope Washington DC has a little bit better weather than we here on the West Coast. I'm broadcasting here from Vancouver and it's uh, 
So we have eight, eight, eight or four a.m. You are at eleven a.m. So and in India, of course, you are. I think India is about sixteen, eighteen hours ahead. So we have all the different time zones. Australia is sixteen hours ahead, and so on. So we have all the different time zones here listening. That is really great. So you see here the animation again of the um, of the movement of the Milky Way. And what is so amazing, if you just stand outside and look at the Milky Way, one is blown away by just looking at millions of stars. And what is so incredible, actually, is you can take nowadays, you can take a camera and you can buy a camera for a couple of hundred dollars and you can just um, go to a beautiful spot and and take an image of the Milky Way. And what you will see is the most incredible details as you zoom in more and more and more. Hi, by the way, from, from California. I'm always jealous of your weather. <laughs> Good to have you here. Uh, GM Greif. Uh, John, yeah. So, and as we zoom in more and more uh, into the Milky Way, we are just blown away seeing millions and millions of stars. This is something that, that I think makes everybody just wonder you know you don't even have to do any analysis just to be incredibly uh, surprised of how many stars there are on our on milky way nobody knows the exact numbers it's somewhere between 100 million and 400 sorry 100 billion and 400 billion and the reason why nobody knows it exactly is because you can't really count okay it's not possible peter is just asking is the zodiac light I could see at the end of the sky animation. That's an interesting question. I, I, I presume that could have been the zodiac light. The zodiac light um, is an interesting phenomenon that, that Peter is, is um, alluding to. So the zodiac light is something that is seen in the southern hemisphere and it is caused by interstellar particles far out uh, in the uh, in um, in in the astro belts. So what happens is sunlight is scattered back, and that is what we call the zodiac light. Hi there from from Buenos Aires, and that could very well be. Ah, uh, there's George from UK. Okay, no no problem. I'm glad I'm glad you can all join. You've missed nothing. Uh, I've just been making everyone aware of the previous episode. Don't don't forget to download the images. Everything's there for you to enjoy. Okay. So that could very well be the zodiac light. By the way, I will be traveling to Australia. I'm very excited to to uh, to tell you this. Ah, there's my friend Vish. He's also that's very nice. Everybody seems to be there. That is wonderful. From all the way from India, we have all the different people. That's wonderful that you're all watching. So I'm getting all these messages on different phones and apps. So that's very wonderful. Good morning to from Florida too. So anyway, I just wanted to tell you, I'm going to be in Australia and um, from the 19th of April, I'm renting a camper van. I'm going to fill it full of my photography equipment, broadcasting equipment. I'll do photography, live streaming of beautiful, you know, I love these beautiful colored birds that they have of nature. I'll be exploring it in a camper van, uh, driving in the middle of nowhere, direction of double. For those Australians, the Australians will know where that is, this New South Wales. And then I'll be traveling all the way to Siding Spring, where the observatory is, and I'll do some live streaming from the observatory for you too, to enjoy it. It's very interesting always to be there, right? So that's going to come up. And um, I haven't made any announcements of any sequences there because I don't know what my conditions are on the road. I don't know how well the um, quality of, uh, of the signal is, but I know that um, Australia in general has very good 4G coverage. So I just wanted to announce that it's quite exciting and I will be doing a lot of um, live streaming at night. Also showing, I want to so much show you the center of our own, own galaxy, by the way. Where is that black hole? And there's a lot of talk about that. We're not going to look at the black hole, but I'll show you the position of the black hole and why it is so interesting in the middle of our Milky Way. Good. Well, let's jump on. Now it gets exciting. So just the previous image again. So we zoom into our own galaxy and the southern sky and we see these billions of stars and we're just completely amazed. But it gets even more amazing. Bonjour Montréal, very nice to have you. And as we zoom in more, and these are really, really, you know, the, the concept of numbers, 
are very difficult to understand. I mean, for a mathematician, it is very easy to write 10 to the power of 10 or 10 to the power of 6, but it is not easy for us to comprehend. And I certainly don't comprehend large numbers really, really in the sense of of understanding because anything about, uh, beyond a million, whether it's a billion, a trillion, a zillion, becomes incomprehensible, uh, incomprehensible for us. So that is why I've always been trying to find analogies that we understand what we're talking about instead of just throwing numbers at you. And this is very interesting because our own Milky Way has a diameter of approximately 100,000 light years. That means light travels from one side to the other takes 100,000 years. Now that seems a lot for us, but it's nothing in the dimensions of the universe. So what I found here uh, from the University of Durham is very, very nice uh, graphics. I just wanted to show you that before we jump into the subject of galaxy clusters. If you look at a range of about 500,000 light years. So we're going way beyond. You can see our Milky Way looks more like the solar system here in the size, in the dimensions. And there, in that radius of 500,000 light years, there's only one big galaxy, and that's our own. And there's, there are quite a few numbers of dwarf galaxies. Dwarf galaxies are satellite galaxies that, that uh, rotate around our own galaxy and they're typically in the south you'll see the large Magellanian cloud, the small Magellanian cloud and so on. Very typical. So this is a radius already of, of um, 500,000 light years which seems a lot for us but this is nothing. Now we move out even further. We move out even further and we are now expanding our radius to 5 million light years. 5 million that is the amount of, so all this, what happens, the universe, telescopes is not about seeing, it is about looking in the past. Everything we see is about the past and we look further and further into the past. And now we find that in a radius of 5 million years, there's the famous Andromeda galaxy, which is about two and a half million uh, light years away, very similar to our own from the spiral galaxy, the triangular uh, triangulum galaxy, that is very, very similar to what, we, what we've seen. And already you can see the number of stars counting is about 700 billion. Now nobody's counting this accurately. This, these are really, really rough estimates. It could easily be a trillion or more. And then we move even further. And then it gets really bizarre because now we are still at a radius of 100 million light years. And we find that some galaxies, not all galaxies, by the way, but galaxies uh, tend to group, just like animals group and humans group, into groups and then into clusters, okay? So in these, we find about 160 groups and we find that there are, that there are about two, two and a half thousand uh, galaxies there in, in a radius of 100 million light years. So you can remember 100 million has about a thousand or so galaxies. That is not actually very much if you think about it. You, you're talking about incredible distances here already. And the closest one that we know is the so-called Virgo cluster. That is quite, that, that is a huge cluster that is studied ex, uh, extensively by astronomers. And then, well, then we move out even further. And then it gets really, really bizarre because this is the cosmic web that we start to see. And we are, we are now looking at 1 billion light years, which is already incomprehend, incomprehensible for us. So there are approximately, let me just see, yeah, there are approximately three, we're looking about 3 million galaxies in a radius of 1 billion. And this is really difficult to understand. And there you will find that there are clusters that again, seem to form into bigger so-called superclusters. So the, we, we ourselves are in a local group with, together with Andromeda and so on. There are about 50, 50 galaxies in total. Then the next one is the Virgo cluster, the Virgo cluster. And then we find that there's a supercluster. So there are clusters again that gravitate around that. And then these superclusters uh, seem to f f uh, form certain filaments throughout the universe. And now we're looking at, uh, at an incredible dimension of already 1 billion. And if you go further, of course, this is the famous cosmic web. 
Is there any reason why there, there are galaxy rich areas and why there are so few? You know, Sean, this is a, <laughs> this is a fundamental question. <laughs> that is a very, very, very good question. And actually, I don't, um, I cannot give you a complete answer to that. This is the, uh, the subject of cosmology where small inhomogeneity, uh, uh, inhomogeneous, um, uh, deviations in what we call baryonic matter have actually um, uh, resulted in these type of patterns. What they have actually done in simulations is they can actually, from from the Big Bang, show that these filaments indeed, um, you know, in, in, indeed evolve like that. But it is nothing. I cannot give you a simple answer to that. I think what would be much better is I would like to get a cosmologist one day, and I know someone who gives you a more explicit answer to this question. It's a very good question. Uh, at first, the universe is very homogeneous, and then when you, when you look at the fine microwave background, you find that there are patterns and filaments in that, and that comes that has very much to do with the origin of the Big Bang. There's another question: Is this 100 megaparsecs uh, range where the universe becomes homomorphic? Well. Um, yes, you could you could say that you could you could say that um, you only see the patterns of super uh, uh, super clusters forming into strings approximately at that scale. Yes, I would I would I would agree with that. But then the question the question is how do we even know that these patterns exist? Is somebody out there counting this all in different directions? And the answer is no. That is not the case. What in fact they're doing, and maybe this helps answer the question, is they have these sky surveys and they're incredible. And this is a typical sky survey. They take a small angle, and this is really current research. They take a small angle and they do massive research, counting every single galaxy. And they count the distance by looking at the redshift. And you can see the redshift. Let me just see if I can get an arrow here. Um, See if we can do this. Yes, there's my arrow. Hopefully, my software won't crash this time. Um, here on the left, that is the redshift. So, what is redshift? Redshift is uh, just shows is a, is a is a measure for distance, and it just shows the shift of the hydrogen uh, of of the hydrogen alpha line. Sorry, the hydrogen balma. Sorry, the the the, the main um, hydrogen line. Uh, which is in the ultraviolet that they measure and they measure the redshift is just if an object moves away from us it gets more reddish and if it moves towards it, it gets more bluish the same that you have when a car moves towards you the frequency increases and the frequency decreases as you move away so you can see the redshift is fairly small you're only looking at 0 0.3 here typically redshifts that get interesting in the galactic dimension or, or in the in the universe dimension are redshift six seven and beyond that okay so they're looking at at a scale of about three billion light years here and they do all the counting here they look they they meticulously look at every single galaxy and you can see there are certain filament patterns in there and then they compare these patterns to the microwave background radiation which is taken and they also look at the x-rays and they look at all the different ones why redshifts are using in the in the measurement that's a great question the question the answer for that is that if you go to large scales you cannot use another method really and it becomes very very difficult to measure uh, distance why redshift is is used is because we know now through observations from hubble and so on that the universe is ex actually expanding and there's this famous uh, number and you may have seen this before from um uh um from um oh, what's sorry what's the, what's what's the book um the uh, yeah, yeah sorry uh, um, a hitchhiker's <laughs> a hitchhiker's guide through the galaxy uh there's a beautiful number it, it's the number 42 what is the answer to all questions in the universe it's the number 42 i love this book and you should you know you should get a chance to read it because it's written with a lot of humor but it has a lot of depth and this number 42 is actually very close because it's the rate of expansion of the universe, which, which, which is 42, if I remember correctly, 42, uh, okay, let, let me get this right, correct, 42, yeah, I think it's 42, the kilometers per second every 3 million years or so, 
I have to get this correct, but the number 42 appears anyway in this. And that basically says the further you go away, the faster, the higher the redshift is. Okay. And um, th this is this is what they do. They just measure the redshift. And it's not the movement of the galaxy that you're actually seeing. It's the expansion of the universe. That is really important. So the universe already is expanding so quickly that the galaxies, no matter what direction they move, cannot keep up with the speed of the of the of of the um, uh, of the um, universe, it's like you walking in a train. If you walk in a train backwards or forwards, your own speed, whether what direction you work uh, you walk in, is completely negligible to the to the speed of the train. Okay, and that's why you can't keep up with the landscape. And that's the same. the The whole universe, all the galaxies, are dragged on. It's a good question. So that's why they use redshift. That is the that is still the most reliable way of looking at distances. Okay. Well, let's move today's, to today's image. And this is where it gets very interesting. So what is so fascinating about these distant clusters? And why do, why do astronomers learn so much? And why are there so many surprises there? Let me just get rid of this arrow again. So today we're going to have a look at the Hercules cluster. It's very famous. So we're looking, if you just remember the scale again, we're looking at 500 million light years. And that's why I gave you an overview picture, 500 million light years. And we take a picture with a telescope. So before we jump in, I just wanted to quickly... Oh, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. Those are great questions. Just throw them at me. That's fine. And I will answer whatever I can. And if I cannot answer them, I will, I will certainly look them up. And I will get some other experts to help because... Um, as you know, cosmology and astronomy is an incredibly wide, a wide field from astrophysics to deep physics. Everything, all the, all the, um, you know, all the areas of expertise are required to have a, have, have understanding all the way down to particle physics, by the way. <laughs> so, okay. What I wanted to show you quickly is how actually, and last time we had interruptions, I'm quickly going to compose an image for you, stacking an image. And it's not very difficult. They have some beautiful software. So before we go in there, let's just jump in on my other screen. Uh, let me just get rid of, let's see here, this screen. And let me open some software and I will show you the images that I took. Okay, so this is a very, very useful tool. It's called CCD Stack. I really like it. There's the other one. And some of you who've communicated with me may know it's Maxim DL. Uh, is also very good, and and there there are many other softwares, but there's something particular I like about CCD Stack, and I'm certainly not running running any um, you know any, any sales not a sales pitch here, but it is just very easy to use. And one thing, and that's the thing um, that's that I remember having a conversation with some of you say, well, how do we actually stack image reliable? And and I think CCD Stack has a very good solution for that. So let's do it. Let's do it straight away. Now here you can see, this is all from yesterday. I've I've taken quite a lot of images in all kinds of things. So I'm going to take what we call the luminous channel. The luminous are the ones that look like black and white pictures, okay? And they have, the, uh, because we are looking at very, very distant scales here at the moment, color is not that important. Color does play a role though, and I'll come, come, uh, come to that. But let's do some quick stacking now. I'm going to do all this live and hopefully it will work. I'm just going to eliminate two of these that come from another telescope. And there we go. And I'm going to open them all. And we are, these are, okay, let me explain to you what's going on here. Um, these are taken from the telescope. Um, this was taken from T31, which I think, if I remember correctly, is a half a meter telescope. So quite a big dish. Um, and... These, this is a five-minute exposure, and already it's, it's quite amazing what you see within five minutes. If you look closely, you can see really uh, tens, dozens and dozens of galaxies here. A really beautiful picture. And what, what, um, so these are five-minute exposures, what we call luminance, okay? And they're all bin one, which means I took the full resolution, okay? I didn't, didn't do any uh, um, exposure integration or so. I just did the fast way, and I'm, I'm scanning through them. And if, if you look at that, I'm, I'm going to put it on blink now. It's blinking and automatically running through all the images. And what you can see, they are slightly misaligned, which is typical. The sky moves, the telescope doesn't get it perfectly right, and so on. So 
they are slightly misaligned. So the first thing that we must do is align all the images. So why am I stacking this? These images, first of all, and I should explain that much better, are in FITS format. Now, why would you say, why don't they put JPEG or TIFF or something useful for that? Why on earth do astronomers come up with FITS format? And this again has historic reasons because scientists like to put a lot of information into their images and FITS formats are very useful for that because if you go into the header of FITS formats, I won't do that now, but there's an information window, you can see exactly where the location was, what type of telescopes they use, what type of atmospheric conditions were, and so on. It's, it's, it's like your notes that you use in a presentation, and every picture has its own story and its exact scientific details in there. And that's why they use these FITS formats. And they use them for Hubble telescope, for the Hubble telescope, and so on. And you can use common software. By the way, um, uh, recently, I was asked, how do you open FITS format files if you don't have this type of software and you don't want to use it? Well, there's a, a program called the FITS Liberator. FITS Liberator is the name. FITS Liberator, you can, you can Google it, and you will be able to open FITS images and import them into Photoshop and so on. You can then transform it. It's, it's, that's free software, by the way. Okay, enough said. Now, what we will do is we, you could see they are misaligned. So what we have to do is we have to align them. And this is, um, this is the way we do it. I go to the column called stack. And then the first thing I have to do is register. One second. I must just get this registration over into the window so you can see it. Yeah, you should be able to see this now. There we go. And what, what, what has happened to the image, it, it, as you can see, it's got this strange color. So what, what is actually, uh, what the software is doing, it's getting a high contrast and trying to find where the stars are. And all I have to press, and this is an important um, plugin in the software, it's called CCDIS. This is a marvelous piece. It's the best type of alignment I've ever seen. I've never had any problems and I just press align all. It's very simple. And now it's going to do a lot of maths. It's going to try and overlay the images and there's already the result. And the most important thing I always look at is what we call the root mean square error. And the error is very small. As long as it's below uh, about 0.1, we are fine. And it's usually that is a very good error. It means the images will be, will be well aligned. And now, um, the program has to do the maths now. What it has to do is that it has to align every single star. And so don't worry about this. It's, a, it's called bicubic B spline. It doesn't really matter what you use. I say just say apply to all. And now it's going to perfectly align the images. And that's the main thing. Otherwise, we cannot do anything with the images. It'll look really strange. And there they are perfectly aligned now. Okay, so now we do one final uh, step, and that's all we need to do now, is we're going to combine them. And I will use the mean. I can also use sum. I'm not going to go through the differences here, but mean is very good. It's, uh, it's, that's why it's right on front, because it's the most common one used. And I'm going to do the mean one, and there we go. Now I have, and let's just see um, where, let me just go through the window here. Where's the image manager? There you go. This is what I wanted to show you. You can see the image manager has now created a new, um, uh, a new one called the mean. It's mean calibrated. So this is the best result. And what has actually happened is the so-called signal to noise ratio, every picture has a lot of noise in, has been drastically in improved. And some of you know it, that's why we take not one luminance, we take five luminance. So you get the best results. So it's like, like getting, instead of taking a five minute image, you take a tw 25 minute image. What is the software you are using called? The software I'm using is called CCD stack. CCD stack, okay? Just like the word CCD and then stack. Very, very, very nice piece of software. I really like it. Very systematic. And I'm very, um, if, if you are interested, I'm very um, willing to give a, a live tutorial on this. And I really want to keep it simple here. And it is not difficult, really. It's not difficult. So I can, I can do that and we can do nice color images together. And I can, we can do this uh, so that you can replicate it. And it's very, very nice to use. If you can use the software, you'll be able to process most images and get really stunning results. Okay, so this is the result. And this result now, so 
that is the calibrated. I could also create color images now, but I'm not going to do it for today's session because the color image will not reveal that much about the galaxies. Okay, so this is CCD stack. So I'm going to jump back now. Great, yeah, it's fun, isn't it? <laughs> and I'm going to import this uh, into um, yeah, here into my stream. And you can see that is the result. And already you notice that you get quite a good contrast here. You have one bright star. And as we zoom in more, I'm going to zoom in properly now, you can see how incredibly detailed this image is. So we are now looking at a telescope image that is about 25 minutes looking at the Hercules cluster, which is about 500 million light years away. And you see incredible details. It's really stunning just to have a look for one second and just to understand what we're actually seeing here. So this cluster consists about uh, of about 200 galaxies and almost everything here is a galaxy. Is that software for free? No, CCD stack is a very is a commercial software and it is not it is not free but you have a 30 day trial which i really um would encourage you to use uh, to make use of and be sure if you do um if you do use the software take the take the plugin called ccdis just do the replay of what i've just done <clears throat> and you will see the plugin ccdis without that plugin the software isn't even half as good. I have no idea why they don't just package it into one, but that's one thing I had to painfully find out from a friend who said, my goodness, you're not doing this correctly. You need this plugin. And as soon as I had this plugin, suddenly things were wonderfully easy. And I, I certainly don't want you to go through that. So make sure when you go to CCD stack, yes. So I'm a Sean, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> Let me just drink a bit of water. Sean has just written it. CCD stack is what it's called. And make sure you have the plugin. Let me just type this in for you one second. Um, I will just do this. So it's called CCDIS. That is the plugin that you need. Very important. It's the alignment tool that does the absolute magic. A session showing how to stack would be great. And Paul, I will do that. I will happily do that. Maybe I'll even do it from Australia <clears throat> because there's nothing better to stand next to the telescopes and do everything from the scratch and show you exactly how it's done. And I certainly am a person who tries to keep things simple and not make them complicated. So it's much better interacting here with you. Very good. So let's take a look at this cluster. Well, what do you notice? First question we should ask is, are all clusters similar? Do they all look similar? Is this what we would, would see if we look into any direction? And the surprising answer is no, it's not. Cluster, oh, there we go. Des has just written the price. So it is, you, some of you say, wow, that's a lot of money, but the value that you get for that is very, very good. Um, it's, it's, you get free software too, but you will never ever You'll, if you have the amount of pain <laughs> that you go through a, a lot of the open source software, as nice as it, they are, but in this case, um, it's worth the investment. I can really tell you that. Good. So what is surprising when we look at the, um, you, you know, the, uh, the Hercules cluster is it's not, it's, it's, it's very different to other clusters. For example, there's a, a big cluster, um, that is quite close by and it's a lot larger. It consists of two, three thousand galaxies called the Coma Cluster. Okay. But the Virgo Cluster and what we see here, ah, there we go. Apologies for a comment about 10 minutes ago. That's fine. Google, are ah, there. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. That's, that's a good comment. So if we zoom into the, um, let me just zoom in a little bit more. One second. Into the, um, into the Virgo Cluster here. Just let's have a, let's have a look at this. Uh, what you do see is there seem to be a lot of disturbed galaxies here. There's a, there has been a lot of interaction, and this is the main thing about clusters of galaxies. Clusters of galaxies are the largest gravitationally bound systems in the universe. Isn't that incredible? So you're talking about billions and billions of stars being, and we are being moved around, shoveled around in the um, in the universe. It's very good that you're giving comments there. Thanks for the software comments. That's great. So we are being shoved around in these huge, huge, uh, so it's not only around the sun, but the sun is moving around our own Milky Way and the Milky Way is moving around in the local group and so on. The local group 
then comes into uh, a, a supercluster, and the superclusters are intertwined in the cosmic web. It is incredible, actually. And if you look at the, the Hercules cluster, you will see that there are a lot of disturbed galaxies. And what is unusual about the Hercules cluster is it seems to be a fairly young cluster because there are a lot of spiral galaxies here. If they are spiral galaxies, it means there's a lot of interstellar dust. If there's a lot of interstellar dust, it means those are birth centers for stars, especially out in the, uh, in the spiral arms. The, contra the, um, the converse to this are elliptical galaxies, and I didn't mention that before, and we will take a look at uh, elliptical galaxies later, uh, you know, in, a, in, in, in some later episode. But if you look at the coma cluster, um, and I don't have a photo this time of, a, of the uh, coma cluster, uh, but you will see that's a much older cluster, and it seems to be the larger the, 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 the clusters are, typically of the coma cluster, the more elliptical galaxies there are. Elliptical galaxies do not have uh, the, the high dust content, and they're, they're, therefore they are, you could say, a little bit burnt out. They don't create these new uh, stars. So you can see from the Hercules, galax uh, from the Hercules uh, cluster, there seems to be a lot of gravitational interaction, a lot of tidal, uh, tidal, we call this tidal interactions, of these galaxies attracting each other, uh, merging, uh, stripping each other. It's quite, and some of these processes are quite violent, actually. So this is, this is what we can see. And there you can see, a, uh, you can see a side-on spiral galaxy here. And as we go through, you can see there's another, there's another interesting one. Can you do a similar thing with register? Okay. Uh, Sean, I'll, uh, yeah, maybe someone can answer that in there because I'm going to stick to this now so that we can um, focus on clusters of galaxies. But uh, go and help your, uh, you know, just use this as a communication platform. So I won't, I won't go into this at the moment, but I will answer it on in a special session. Okay, so you can see there has been so much interaction here, and look, look at this. Um, hang on. I must make sure that, that, that I keep the, the, the picture up to date. You can see here all the different interaction. You can see these, these um, let me just get an arrow here. So one second, make sure that you're seeing all this. You see that arrow, you see these three galaxies interacting with each, with each other. And let's move a little bit more. Look at this funny one here. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? You see a completely stretched galaxy here and so on. It is absolutely amazing what you can, well, the, the level of details. And these are all fairly young galaxies, like our, like our own galaxy is. It's a spiral galaxy, okay? So very interesting to look, look at the image here. So there is something really curious. Okay, what is the catalog number for this? Uh, it, it, okay, I'll give it to you. I'll, let me type it in. Let me type it in. This, the Her if you type in the Hercules cluster, it's a bell. Um, I think it's 2151 is the one. That's what it's called. That is, no, a, no, sorry, I misspelled that. A B A A B E L L. A bell was, that is a famous astronomer who has, who has spent a lot of time in his life looking at clusters of galaxies, okay? That's what it's called. Okay, so it's uh, it's always A B E L L, and then comes the the number and the coma cluster. I don't remember what that was off by heart, but you can look it up. Just type Google Hercules, you know, her, just the Hercules cluster, just the um, and then then you'll find this. It's a Hercules cluster, and you can get a beautiful image by the way if you want to use eye telescope for that. You know, um, knock yourself out, as one says. <laughs> it's it's a lot of fun. Okay, well, there's something. There are a few interesting things I just wanted to allude to. So once again, most galaxies lie in clusters, which are groupings of many thousands of galaxies. Our own Milky Way itself, again, as I said before, is in a local group, which is a band about 50 galaxies. Okay, and that's and also the Andromeda uh, galaxies in there, and it's about 2.5 or 2.3 million light years away. And then we have the Virgo cluster, which is about 50 million light years away with 2,000 members. And then as you go more and more, now comes the interesting thing. In 1970, the, the astronomers discovered something very interesting, which I find really peculiar. The, uh, all that space, or, uh, not all that space, but a lot of space in between galaxies are actually filled with very hot gas, 
very hot gas. Now, why would it be very hot gas? That is really strange because the contradiction is this very hot gas should have cooled off. So this was a big surprise to astronomy. And there, this, this caused major, major uh, puzzles. So they were looking at the X-ray. Let me just zoom out again. They were looking at the X-ray images of... Um, let's see if I can... Oh, one second. That's the arrow. That's the wrong one. Um, where are we here? I have to zoom out. Let me just get rid of the arrow. There we go. Yeah, that's better to see. It's better to see the big big scale here. That's be, that's that's uh, better to see the big scale here. So they found that there's a lot of hot gas in this, and this is really strange because one would have expected that the galaxies have their own hot gas. So what happens is through the, all the interactions of all the galaxies, um, there, there is a lot of turbulence. And this is still current research. They're going on about this. this is, uh, very, I'm referring to very, very recent papers called Turbulent Heating in Galaxy Clusters, Brightest in X-rays and so on. This is, you're talking about 2014. They're trying to understand how it's actually possible for such hot gases to exist and why they actually exist. And what's even more interesting is this hot gas acts like a fluid, which is really strange. It acts like a fluid. So the galaxies are moving through this hot glass and a lot of the interstellar dust seems to be stripped off from the galaxy. So it's like it's left behind, you know, it's like, like you losing some of your hair, or <laughs> I don't know what to say, um, um, as, as you go through wind or so, okay? It's like, or if you're swimming and you don't have your, your swimsuit on properly, it's like losing your swimsuit, which you hopefully wouldn't want. <laughs> but galaxies are stripped off their, um, their interstellar dust. And this is really, so this is why it's so interesting. And also the, this very, very hot gas, um, creates a lot of very hot elements. And so they are finding a lot about the basic elements in the universe by looking at that. Okay, so I think that's about all I wanted to tell you today. A lot of interesting things about the um, about uh, galaxies, uh, galaxy clusters, super clusters, really interesting. And it's really, we're jumping very much into current research and the question of how many uh, you know, how many galaxies there are in the universe. The latest estimates that I've seen is that there are at least one trillion. The latest Hubble results seem to indicate that there are 10 times more than we ever thought. So, and we're talking only about the observable universe here. The observable universe is the universe that we can see when we look very far back, but there beyond what is observable is the light that hasn't reached us yet. And that is much, much further. And we can only assume that the universe is very similar there, but who knows? Well, my friends, on that note, I hope you enjoyed this. I can see there's a lot of discussion here about Registacks, which is great. If you want me to, I can also do a separate one again on Registacks and I can show you images. By the way, I wanted to tell you something really exciting. I have a solar scope and I did my first image of the sun, of the sun's surface. And Maybe in Australia, I can give you a special uh, session on the sun, which is incredible. It's our closest star, and you can see a lot of the, the surface convection, the movement, the magnetic fields, the lines, and um, um, of course, the photosphere and so on of the sun. It's very, very interesting. And that's where, by the way, I use programs like uh, Registax and so on. So I could, I could show you all that and it will get very interesting, okay? So we'll do some live solar um, scoping if I get through, hopefully I'll get through the, <laughs> through the, through customs and so on with all my equipment. <laughs> I hope I, my, my solar scope I'm going to put in my rucksack and take it along on the plane. So it's going to be rather peculiar. <laughs> so if I can get all my equipment across, uh, which I hope I can, um, I will do some solar scopes and um, I will show you how to do live stacking and all that and beautiful structure. At the moment, we have high activities of the sun. By the way, if you do have a look at Jupiter, Jupiter is very visible at the moment too. It's very close. It's in opposition to the Earth. So there are a lot of things going on. By the way, and one final thing next week, that's the final week before I go to Australia, I will do Saturn Live. Don't miss it. Saturn Live. It's going to be very, very interesting. Photo of the sun in H alpha. That's, that's, 
That's beautiful, Mike. That's beautiful. Well, I do the H alpha, but sodium and calcium, that's very interesting. You, you know, if you ever want to contribute something to this, call me or, or just write to me. Um, I'm very interested to have your, your participation. I heard that if two galaxies collide, it could be transparent to each galaxy as if it never happened. Yes, it, it, that is completely correct. It depends on the angle and the transition, but it can actually happen that they sort of just go through each other like ghosts. That, well, thank you very much. And thank you, everyone. So do join me. I think if I remember correctly, Saturn, just because of the time, it'll be, I think, next Saturday. And this has to be a clear sky. So I cannot promise it because I really want to give it live to you. If I don't manage, don't worry. I will definitely show you Saturn when I'm in Australia. And um, it'll be a lot of more of spontaneous, uh, spontaneous um uh, shows there. I do wanted to say one thing. I will also be on Periscope. I don't know if you ever heard Periscope, but Periscope sometimes has an easier way of broadcasting than YouTube or on Twitter. So my, um, I'm just going to type in my account. So that's Zasa Photo. Just look for Zasa Photo on Periscope. It's an app and you'll find, I'll do a lot of my bird uh, photography there, but I will use iTelescope whenever possible, of course, because, um, my telescope has this incredible platform that I don't have myself. And um, okay, well, thank you, everyone. So Jupiter is great. I, I, it's good you enjoyed it. Well, thanks, everyone. And, and thanks to Vichy, too. I can see they're all coming. All your comments. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And you, we look forward to Saturn. I think just look at the time of episode 10. And it'll give you everything. You, I can't wait until I'm in Australia. Well, I'm so glad you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the session with you. And um, well, have a very, have a very, very good, eventful and curious week and see you soon. Thank you.